Hello and welcome. Uh, in 2008, my guest wrote this book, Billions of Entrepreneurs, How China and India Are Reshaping Their Futures and Yours. So a question which is somewhat pertinent in 2017, given what's happening in the new post-Trump, post-Brexit world. So let me put that question to Tarun Khanna, who's uh, the George Paulo Lehman Professor at Harvard Business School. So Tarun, tell us, how, if you were to write that book again today, in 2017, how would you write it and would it be different? You know, people had this uh, bias or had this continuing bias to assume that countries in the world have sort of figured out one optimal model for how to organize themselves and that things are inexorably going to move towards that model. Uh, the starting point for the work that I did initially with a Chinese colleague, Guang Yasheng at MIT, was that actually no, society is organized really quite differently and it's a little bit presumptuous to think that we're all going to gravitate to one model. If anything, I would say that the last uh, uh, 10 odd years has borne that out quite robustly and quite dramatically recently yes. because the idea that, that we are at the end of history, so to speak, to quote a better man, uh, seems increasingly preposterous in many different ways. Um, and I think the spirit of the book uh, is in some sense validated or revalidated, which is that each of these countries have their own organizing logic that at an aggregate level, of course, everybody cares about societal welfare and the welfare of their citizens and so on and so forth and progress and poverty alleviation and all these good things. Uh, but the manner in which societies implement this and see it actioned out is a much more complicated function of different ways of doing things. And in particular, in those, those two countries, the reason we picked those two, other than, of course, the fact that I'm Indian and my colleague was Chinese, Chinese yeah is that uh, they constitute a very nice, if you will, a natural experiment. So the closest thing that you can get to a natural experiment in, in, in the social sciences, they are both large, proximate countries, populous countries with long civilizational histories and long periods of domination by the, by the colonial regimes and so on. Uh, and yet they went in completely different directions when the modern nation state was born. So uh, I would uh, write it perhaps more strongly uh, than I wrote it <laughs> last time. Right with uh, redoubled conviction. Right, and but how, how do you see the forces of de-globalization, a much used term in the last few months, play out then? Um, you know, at one level, of course it was a surprise to everybody, the, the rapidity with which things have unfolded with Brexit and uh, Mr. Trump and so on and so forth, and uh, continuing to unfold on, on the European continent. Uh, but that said, if you take an academic's view, the long run view of history, it's not unprecedented by any means. You've had plenty of periods of deglobalization. If anything, we seem to go in cycles. Um, so at one level, it's not surprising as an academic. On the other hand, uh, by nature, I'm 50% uh, an academic and 50% an entrepreneur. And my entrepreneurial bias is to say, well, let's see the way the decks are stacked now and uh, try to figure out the best way forward. So I think it's going to bring up a lot of uh, distress to existing models that are predicated on continued globalization and a lot of opportunities for many others, particularly those, and I think India is really well placed, as is China, with large domestic markets that uh, can cater to doing things within their own, their own borders. Yeah, you're part of a fund which is investing in startups in India, for instance. I mean, you, you Yeah, so we, uh, with some colleagues from Infosys, particularly Chris and uh, Shivu, uh, we, we and a couple other guys, Ganpati and Srinath, and I created, a, created something called Axelor, which is very aggressively trying to shape the entrepreneurship ecosystem in, uh, in, in Bangalore initially, but we hope eventually more broadly. Yeah. Right. But would, I mean, I, I, I'm not to sound facetious, but yeah. would, would it be a precondition that you should not have companies who are thinking global first and, you know? No, no, not at all. Not yeah. at all. I mean, I, just to give you an example, currently I am uh, working on two, two companies of my own both started with my students. One is, uh, one is uh, Chai Point, which I'm going to talk about this, this afternoon. And it's a very retail, street side, uh, you know, tea for the masses uh, kind of store that's extremely tech enabled for scale. Um, so that's a completely domestic business. There's really no global play, even though the investors are all global investors. And the other is a diabetes management company, uh, Jana Care, with two other students, uh, which is a completely global business. So it's half in Boston and half in Bangalore. So, no, I, wouldn't, I would not reach a conclusion like that. I think you just have to be uh, much more careful to not slip into generalizations that distort, uh, say, an investing logic or an academic logic. Right. So, one more question on the, on the same plane. Yeah, you know, yeah. The Economist did a study which seemed to suggest that, you know, how multinationals were in some ways losing their touch mm -hmm. and they were not able to grow markets in the way they were growing earlier, domestic. Yeah. Compare competition was much stronger than ever before local brand. Yeah. How, how do you see that from your vantage point? Uh, so I agree with the broad thrust of that, uh, that column that I do remember. 
uh, it basically said that the whatever return on capital, return on invested capital ratio that you down. use, it's been going down in recent years. Um, uh, but I wouldn't have stated it quite as strongly as I did because the um, related fact is that if at any point in the last 20 years you had plotted, let's say, the distribution of multinational returns in a particular country and stack them against the distribution of returns of local entrepreneurs in that country, you'd see a significant overlap. Mm. So the, the idea that this you know, mean or median statistic communicates as much as was made out in that column is perhaps a little extreme. Mm. But that said, I agree with it, that there is, uh, and it's related to that deglobalization or difficulties of globalization. Uh, yeah, model. which in, in sort of predates Trump. Same idea. Yeah. Yeah, 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 no, no, it predates Trump. Trump is just the expression. Mm. Um, uh, of a lot of, uh, a lot of angst, um, both in my own backyard, mm. uh, which again I say I don't want to sound like I know what the heck is going on because <laughs> I know as little of it as you probably do and we were all surprised by it. Uh, but that said, we can now reinterpret what's happening around us. Right. So what are the one or two things that you're working on in the, in the coming year that we could be watching out for? Um, so I continue to work on my interests in entrepreneurship as a way to uh, orchestrate societal development. That's been my interest for 20 years. Uh, primarily as an academic at Harvard, and uh, which is a real privilege because we have so many motivated smart kids from all over the world coming, including from many developing countries. So it's a little bit of a petri dish environment where I get to observe various experiments. And about a decade ago, I started to get involved in actual ventures, which has been a lot of fun. And uh, I get to put my limited money where my mouth is, uh, but also get, get really involved. And uh, it's really much more fun than giving a speech. Uh, of course, today's speech is going to be fine, but, yeah. but giving speeches is less exciting than actually building things. So, uh, so I'm enjoying it. But it's all about entrepreneurship. And, uh, and even the work that I had done uh, last year with, uh, with the Indian government, with Niti Aayog, is really more trying to put together a policy framework uh, that hopefully can guide some of the policy decisions that this government uh, and the previous government, but this one in particular, seems to be pretty uh, impatient to put into, put into place, as is the work with uh, my Axelor colleagues and so on. Right. Thank you very much for speaking with us, and all the best with Chai Point and Jana, right? Thank you so much. Yeah.